getting used to. <laughs> Here we go. Awesome. Oh, still got people coming in. Welcome to my talk on mould and residential tenancy. What I'd like to do is to uh, get you up to date in relation to uh, the Residential Tenancy Act and the legislation that it that underpins uh, land that landlords are required to follow and for tenants to get an idea as to what their rights are under the, the Act and especially the one that's just come out in Victoria, the tenancy regulations, um, which takes effect as of this month. My name is Nicole Bausma and uh, I am the CEO of the Building Biology or Australian College of Environmental Studies. I began the Building Biology movement two decades ago and I'm about to complete my PhD on the impact of health hazards in the built environment with a focus on environmental chemicals and wireless technology on brain sleep and heart function and also publishing on mold and autoimmune disease. I'm a building biologist, which essentially means I, we go into people's homes to assess to see if they're making people sick. Um, and I'm here to tell you that many people's illnesses, I would argue the majority of patients' chronic illnesses are due to something in their house, which isn't surprising in light of the fact we spend at least 90% of our time in the built environment. And of course, COVID just escalated this. I will give you some stats in relation to the prevalence of um, damp buildings in the Australian housing stock and why we're getting to crisis point in relation to exposure and our understanding now in scientific literature of the impact of water damage buildings on human health. As building biologists, we liaise with lots and network with lots of different professionals. A lot of the work we get is from integrative clinicians um, and doctors who specialise in chronic multimorbid conditions like chronic fatigue syndrome and autoimmune diseases and diseases that are really tricky to, to treat that most GPs would really have no idea about because it takes time to spend with these patients to understand why they're so sick for so long. As a result of the work we do, we also uh, identify what potential root causes could exist in the house and more importantly, refer the client to different people and specialists depending on what's actually going on, whether it's electromagnetic field exposures, whether it's due to water damage or drainage issues or plumbing, um, et cetera, or restoration and remediation. In 2018, um, Professor Mark Cohen and I published a report, RACV report, which we were paid to do, and unfortunately it's not public knowledge. However, I'll give you a summation of the summary of that report. Um, and in short, it, it identified systemic failures across multiple industries. And the fact that in Australia, we have what could only be described as the perfect storm um, as a result of dampness and mold and its implications on human health. The report and the interviews that I conducted to write the report with many waterproof membrane consultants, plumbers, um, various trades, builders, building industry, etc., showed that there are so many failures across multiple industries that have escalated our exposures to biotoxins in buildings. We know that as a result of building tight homes, and especially in relation to poor building design and practices, that it has significantly escalated condensation in new builds. And this is reflected by the number of um, litigation that is happening at NCAT, VCAT, and at the Supreme Court, which I'll allude to. There are waterproof membrane failures from moving from sheet-based membranes to liquid membranes. In theory, liquid membranes should be sufficient, but unfortunately, the way in which they are applied is so poor that it doesn't comply with the manufacturer's guidelines and it hasn't had time to cure, that it's causing a huge amount of problems. And what we are seeing is membrane failures within two to seven years of new renovations or new builds, which is really not good enough. Water vapour mismanagement, uh, as a result of tight buildings, there is inadequate passive ventilation to allow water vapour to move through, that the membranes, that are vapour membranes that are being used are impermeable and they do not allow the water vapour to move through the building envelope, which essentially means when you get um, water vapour hitting a cool surface, it condenses when it hits dew point 
And if that liquid water stays for more than 48 hours, you have microbial growth hidden within walls, roof voids and subfloors, which means potentially a mould related problem in new builds. We also have water vapour mismanagement because often occupants, you know, I've gone to homes where um, one particular lady didn't like the sound of the exhaust fan, so she refused to put it on and there's mould growing all over her bathroom <laughs> and she has chronic fatigue-like symptoms. So sometimes this can be an occupant-related issue because they don't understand the importance of uh, water vapour and it, um, moving that out of the built environment. The introduction of flexible braided water hoses um, that replaced copper pipe around two decades ago. These are the number one cause of water events and insurance claims accounting for $320 million in insurance claims every single year. They only have a service life of around five years. So it's really important they are replaced at least every five years as they are again, the number one cause of water events in Australian homes. And it tends to happen when you're on your one and only European trip come back and you know there's a whole flood because um, these water hoses have split so this is a problem as opposed to the old copper pipe which lasted you know three four decades before it needed to be replaced heating ventilation air conditioning um, now people are very dependent I mean at the significant majority of housing stock in this country has a heating, ventilation and air conditioning system, but so few people actually maintain it. In fact, I have not yet come across someone who actually maintains and cleans and services their um, split system at least once or twice a year. Sometimes this can be the cause of the fungal particulate or mould in their building, simply because it's not condensing appropriately, they're putting it too low, and as a result of, um, you know, putting it 18 degrees, which of course air conditioning systems are not designed to do that. It's not cycling appropriately. And now you have moisture. And once you have dust in that in that split system, it's going to be a, a mold box that's going to spread that fungal particulate throughout the rest of the home. And sometimes it's that that's causing the problem. So a big part of the work we do as building biologists is actually educating people. You've got to maintain your house. You have to service your split system. Living in a humid climate is already going to be a issue in terms of mould and dehumidification is going to be really important and I'll talk a lot about that. The magnitude of the problem, we know, we suspect at least one in two Australian homes have some degree of water damage, that 40% of new builds in temperate climates experience condensation based on the research conducted by Dewsbury um, and Professor and um, Tim Law, Dr. Tim Law, who's an architectural scientist, as a result of their study on scoping study of condensation in new residential buildings in temperate climates, that's Melbourne and uh, Tasmania. So 40% experience condensation as a result of water vapour mismanagement. 85% of strata owners in buildings built since 2000 said their buildings were defective. I mean, that is extraordinary for new builds to have de defects and they're relatively new. Uh, litigation is happening all over the planet. Um, this one was the one that really started off in the US in 2014. As a result of this, there was a 32 million, and that's a US $32 million payout as a result of adverse health effects experience in this house. It subsequently, when it went through court again, was reduced, but it was the first time that a lot of money was spent on um, the impact of mold on human health and, and the, the builder was sued. I'll just get you to mute yourself, please. Um, and this really set the precedent for the whole mold remediation and restoration industry was developed. The ICRC, which is considered to be the world's leading industry um, precautionary principle on mould remediation and the principles behind how to remediate was began as a result of this court case. This was the Institute of Inspection, Cleaning, Restoration Certification. And you'll hear about the ICRC and why it's important to get restorers or remediators who are at least ICRC certified. But it all began with this particular case in the US, which resulted in a multi-million dollar payout. It has since resulted in many countries now acknowledging that mould and dampness is attributed to lung-related infections, 
colds and flus that keep coming back. We know it causes asthma and allergies that's well established in the scientific literature. And now we're starting to get an understanding that it could be correlating with um, patients with chronic fatigue syndrome and potentially autoimmune diseases. In Australia in 2017, the magnitude of the impact of leaky buildings and mould is resulting in enormous amount of court battles in this country, including the Supreme Court. And the problem is that many of the builders are following the National Construction Code and the Australian standards, but the standards and the code are completely inadequate because they've failed to consider the impact of water vapour on the built environment. Uh, in Australia, um, you know, as I said, many, many cases as a result of this. Uh, in 2017, a seven-year court case resulted in a multi-million dollar payout on the basis that the landlord failed to remediate premises to arrest moisture ingress that had an impact on the premises because it was not fit for occupation. New Zealand has recently implemented a Healthy Home Act in 2017, which is remarkable as a result of their leaky syndrome, leaky home syndrome. They have the highest rate of asthma in Western countries, and they've acknowledged that damp homes and lack of insulation and poor housing is probably the biggest contributing factors to poor health. Um, as a result of this, they have done an amazing job in developing the Residential Tenancy Healthy Home Standard Regulations, which was enforced in late 2019. And this has resulted in some really good um, material to help landlords and to help tenants understand what is required in order to prevent mould in the built environment. As of the 1st of July this year, all landlords in New Zealand must ensure their rental properties comply within 90 days of new tenancy, that it is adequately heated, adequately insulated, has significant passive ventilation, that there's no moisture ingress or dampness, and there's no drafts. All rental homes need to comply with this Healthy Home Act by July. So there's some significant movement and changes happening in the world, I have no doubt, in a short period of time that we're going to see something like this in Australia. And the first of that has come recently in this month when uh, Victoria introduced its regulations for residential tenancy, which I'll go into. The UK in 2018 now has a Home Fitness for Human Habitation Act <laughs> 2018. This is, was enforced uh, in 2019. And basically it really puts landlords on notice as to the fact that they are liable if they don't create or have a home that's fit for habitation. Uh, the Homes Act, as they refer to it, ensures all rented host houses and flats are fit for human habitation. Now, this is going to be an interesting one in court because as a building biologist, what we're finding is what's fit for habitation for one person in that family may not be adequate for another person. And now that we've mapped the human genome in 2003, we're starting to get a really good idea as a result of looking at the gene profile that some people are reacting very adversely and differently to other people in the same house because of this gene profile, because of their detoxification pathways. So in court, this is going to be interesting how this um, is mapped out because fit for habitation will depend on risk and susceptibility. And as we start bringing in metabolomics, as we start bringing gene profiles into medicine, we're start, starting to actually be able to specifically apply this. And it may take another five or 10 years, but state that this person with this gene profile cannot live, that's not fit for habitation this house for that particular person, but maybe okay for their partner. So this is the complexities of what this is going to be involved. And I'm sure lawyers are going to make a, they're, you know, rubbing their hands together because it's just could stay in court for a long time. But medicine is really moving forward. So, and within five to 10 years, you know, gene profiling and fit for habitation is going to be an interesting one to discuss in court. Because as, as I said, as building biologists, we will see specific people in the family, children, asthmatics, people with atopic constitutions, that's allergies, people with chronic fatigue-like symptoms, that what you would say is fine for a healthy person that doesn't have asthma and what you would say for someone with chronic fatigue and asthma, uh, what you would accept on a lab report for mould is very, very different. 
Tenants will have more power to take landlords to court in the UK. No. Remember, this is no. the UK no. uh, Habitat Act. No. <laughs> Leo, <laughs> kids, are about, kids are about to come home. He's just barking. <laughs> the court can make the landlord carry out repairs or put right health and safety problems and pay compensation to tenants. Great. Oh, that's what happens when you work from home. So the court can make the landlord carry out repairs. And I'm going to tell you right now, these repairs are probably going to be in the thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. And you've only got 48 hours to act by the time you have moisture penetrating the building environment. So I'm going to go into that. Okay, according to the Residential Tenancy Act 1997, um, in, this is an Australian Act now, a landlord must ensure that rented premises are maintained in good repair. So this is in Australia. This was the Residential Tenancy Act in 97. It must be maintained in good repair under Section 68.1 of the Act. A landlord who fails to carry out repairs of which he knows or ought to know is in breach of this duty, now, this is surprising because this is, was in 1997 and yet many times people will ring me, tenants will ring me and say, look, I'm really sick and the landlord does not want to act. Well, in theory, they're obliged to act. They have a responsibility to provide a premises that is fit for habitation under this Act. Now, as of this month, the Residential Tenancies Regulation in 2021 came into um accordance this, this month for Victoria and under sec section 16.2 from the 31st of December this year residential rental providers landlords must disclose to the rental applicants if the residential rental provider has received a repair notice in the past three years relating to mould or damp in the premises caused by or related to the building structure. So I would be, knowing what I know about mould and the prevalence of dampness in the built environment, I would, you know, a landlord cannot afford not to get a building biologist to take, to, to do pre-inspection audit because the reality of actually buying a house, renting it out and having damp in that could result in hundreds of thousands of dollars of cost to that landlord. Not only is that built structure could be affected, but the impact you have on that tenant's contents could be in the order of tens of thousands of dollars. And I'll explain why as we go through into remediation. Now, the National Construction Code already states really clearly that in different uh, classes that you are required, landlords are required to act. And these are, of course, newer homes that there is under the performance provisions 2.2 that the damp and weatherproofing um, occupants must be safeguarded from illnesses as a result of surface water or external moisture entering a building. That surface water resulting from a storming, resulting from a storming a storm having an average recurrence of interval of 20 years and which is collected or concentrated by a building or site work must be disposed of in a way that avoids damage to that building. Whether proofing a roof and external wall must prevent the penetration of water. Now, I can tell you now, old roofs leak, and unless you're replacing tiles, unless they're regularly inspected, unless the stormwater system is regularly inspected and the gutters are regularly cleaned and the downpipes are cleaned, most of the homes I see that are at least, you know, 20, 30, 40 years old, their stormwater system is compromised, apart from the fact that they're not maintained. So these are really big issues that, everyone needs to address to prevent um, moisture penetrating into the roof void. Dampness, moisture from the ground and rising damp must be prevented from causing unhealthy or dangerous conditions or undue dampness or deterioration of building, um, um, building structure. If mould is a result of a landlord's failure to properly maintain the premises, the landlord can be in breach of the residential tenancy agreement um, and the landlord is obliged to repair the problem and could also be liable to pay for compensation to the tenant for loss of the use of the property and amenities, cost to test the building. And I quote, for a single storey home, um, you know, up to three bedrooms, I quote 1500 minimum to test a building because the tenancy, um, the actual air sampling alone is around 100 to 120 dollars per sample, and most people need at least eight to ten samples. So, you know, the testing alone is going to be expensive. 
that's why it's really important that landlords and real estate agents and building managers encourage their tenants as soon as there's any liquid water, as soon as they're aware of mould, to act as fast as possible and encourage them to do it without fear of going, I'm going to be kicked out of the, the property. Um, and there's been many cases where the landlord has been sued as a result of this. So if water migrates from one apartment to another, then the owner of the source apartment is liable for the damages that flow from that nuisance. Is the tenant obligated to undertake the task of cleaning mould off the walls? Actually, they're not. That's the landlord or the building manager's responsibility. Can the tenant apply for a rent reduction? Apparently, yes. This can be negotiated between the tenant and the owner and property manager. So here's some links you can go to. If a tenant can be shown to be responsible for mould. So there are times where the occupants can be responsible for causing the mould. Now, this can be a cultural issue. There have been cases where people who've been brought up in villages, remote villages, get buckets of water and pour it on themselves and that's how they bathe. They go to a Western country and instead of using the shower and the bath, they're literally getting a bucket, standing in the bathroom and pouring it on top of them. And that bathroom is not designed to deal with that. Um, I've spoken to a couple of waterproof membrane consultants who said that's been the problem. Rare, but it happens. I mentioned one where they refused to put the exhaust fan on because they didn't like the sound. If I was a landlord, I would build that, that home in a way to get rid of the human factor. As soon as the light goes on in the bathroom, the fan goes on automatically and stays on for a good five, 10 minutes afterwards. So it's built in, so you're not even relying on the occupant to make sure the exhaust fan goes on. Making sure that the when the exhaust fan is on, that it's exhausted not to the roof void, but to the outside. Getting a plumber and spending $200 with the plumber to put a whirly bird up there and to get some flexible duct and, and, and make sure it's going to the exterior, not the roof void, can be the difference between, you know, a, a small mold job and a massive hundreds of thousands of dollars because you've got all this water vapour in the roof void causing mold in other parts of the house so the way if you're going to be a landlord there's things you can build in to reduce the human factor to ensure that moisture isn't a problem in that home uh, section 62 of the act obligates tenants to keep the premises reasonably clean and report damage unfortunately most of the tenants and rightfully so are scared to report it to the real estate agent because many of the real estate agents and landlords um, don't act and in fact now encourage them to move out or um, you know their fear of losing their lease and then they have to find another house and that's actually not on so I think what really needs to be done is a complete change in our mentality and uh, real estate agents and building managers and realtors and landlords need to say and encourage them as soon as they move in thanks for moving to the property here's some tips as soon as you get liquid moisture etc it's an adverse health effects we want to get on to it fast as possible because we care about your health and we care about our property because the reality is as soon as moisture is there you're going to attract pests you're going to attract dust mites you're going to affect the building structure over time and you're going to cause mold which eventually could make that entire house not fit for habitation and cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to fix so it's in the interest of the landlord and the real estate agent and building manager to encourage the tenants to actually state when there is actually liquid water or, or any form of plumbing issue without fear of actually being kicked out of that property. So everything you don't want to know about mold. A water damaged building is a chemical stew of bacteria, fungi, and byproducts. Within 48 hours, liquid water sitting on a surface is going to encourage the fungi and the bacteria that's already sitting on the surfaces. Fungi is nature's greatest decomposers. They are from the Arctic to the Antarctica. As soon as, and they're all over the surface of your house, they're on your body, in your clothes, and they're meant to be there. Fungi is not the enemy here, moisture is the problem. A healthy home is a dry home like a Mediterranean-like climate. It's not wet. As soon as you have liquid water for 48 hours, the bacteria and the fungi already sitting on the surface is going to start producing chemicals to kill each other off 
to infiltrate the substrate and the surface they're on to use it as a a source of food because fungi can't create its own food. It has to release enzymes to break up the substrate that it's sitting on. And then it's going to release what we call fungi farts or microbial VOCs or gases at room temperature and mycotoxins. And these chemicals are some of the most dangerous chemicals that you could possibly expose to on this planet. And you're in the way. So as it's degrading your building structure and elements, and you're breathing in these chemicals, your kids start with respiratory tract infections, colds and flus that keep coming back, or bronchitis or pneumonia. Many patients I see end up with pneumonia in water damaged buildings, or even things like fatiguing syndrome or MS. I can't tell you how many women I see with MS that start in damp related environments. So the key here is the liquid water. You need to dry that out within 48 hours. After 48 hours, these chemicals are released and that's when it goes from a water restoration job to a mould remediation job, from a few hundred dollars to thousands, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or the building needs to be destroyed. So this is why it's so important to act as fast as possible. So I've mentioned water damage can result in structural, in, it could affect the structural integrity integrity of the building, it attracts pests and termites. One of the most important questions we as building biologists ask is, is there any history of termites that you're aware of? Because where the termites are, that's where the moisture tends to be, and that's potentially where the mould could be. Um, always we ask about renovations. Many times my patients get sick after a reno because the builders come in, tore down the tiles in the bathroom, and now there's hidden mold that has now exposed the entire house to this fungal particulate that spread throughout the house. The builders dragged these wet materials through the house and now the whole house is high in what we call condition two or fungal particulate. Now that's gonna be tens of thousands of dollars to actually clean that building properly to reduce that occupant's exposure to the, those fungi. Um, it can make the occupant sick, I'll talk about that. It increases the risk of litigation. And I'm here to tell you there's so much literature on the impact of damp buildings on human health. And it's been around for a good 20 years now, two decades. The National Institute of Medicine, the World Health Organization, New York State, US Department of Housing and Urban Development, US Governmental Accountability Office, and multiple researchers in this space have shown time and time again over the last two decades that water damaged buildings is causative for asthma and allergies. So that's chronic nasal discharge, hay fever-like symptoms, runny eyes, lacrimation, red eyes, itchy congested nose, and also bronchitis, um, chronic colds and flus, and of course, pneumonia. So that's what it does in healthy occupants that don't have a specific gene profile. So in healthy people in water, long-term water, water damaged buildings, you're going to get respiratory problems. Children will often get skin rashes as well. So a lot of persistent eczema can be due to water damage. However, it can also cause fatiguing-like symptoms. All of the references for this information is in my book, Healthy Home, Healthy Family. Now, these fatiguing symptoms um, are what we now think is associated also with gram-negative bacteria. In a healthy home, we have a lot of gram-positive bacteria, and that's because you're shedding bacteria all the time. In fact, you shed between 14 and 37 million bacterial genome copies every hour just from you shedding through your skin, etc. And, of course, because you're more bacteria than you are human cells. So the carpet is the archaeological dig site of the house, and we forensics is forever changed as a result of uh, mapping the human genome and the ability to, call, to do what we call DNA testing or PCR testing of the household dust. Every plant, every animal, every human that walked in your house, it's there in the carpet. Every pet, um, every insect, it's there in the, in the uh, carpet itself. In a water damaged building, what happens is we go from grams positive bacteria like staphylococcus, which is mainly what's on your skin and micrococcus and pseudomonas, to gram-negative bacteria. Gram-negative bacteria your immune system reacts to. It doesn't react to gram-positive bacteria because it's what's already on your skin. But in a water-damaged building, the bacteria, especially long-standing water-damaged buildings because they have high water activities above 90%, it turns into gram-negative bacteria like actinobacteria. And in the cell walls are endotoxins or proteins that stimulate an immune response. 
This immune response in some people is so damaging that it results in chronic fatigue-like symptoms and many autoimmune diseases, like potentially things like MS, I believe. Um, it results in fatigue, fibromyalgia, poor concentration, poor memory. It results in what we call a pre alzheimer brain. And what we're finding now with research is that it actually causes what we call hyperperfusion of the capsulothalamic area as a result of MRI testing. And in short and layman's terms, it means restricted blood flow in a part of the brain that's involved in concentration and memory. So I'm really excited about the fact that we're starting to map the biochemistry and the pathology behind these diseases. But what we now need to get is to the real estate agents and the landlords. This is really serious shit going on here. And it's affecting tens of thousands of people, literally. So once we now have an understanding of this, we've got this amazing pathway that we can understand that 25% of people that are in water damaged buildings that have this particular gene profile, they end up with these fatiguing like symptoms that most doctors yet don't ask the right questions to identify. So that's the good news and the bad news. Um, but the good news is we can do something about it once we understand what happens in a water damaged building. So how do we know if our building is, is water damaged? And the sad news is some of the worst times I've ever been in, I couldn't smell mold and I couldn't see it. Now, the two markers that we know in the scientific literature are associated with adverse health effects is visible mold and odor. Why odor is such an important um, sign is because odor means the fungi is actually growing and it's releasing chemicals and you're smelling those chemicals. So as soon as you have a damp, musty odor, there is a problem and that actual growth needs to be found. And that's where a building biologist is really important. If there's visible mold, that's critical. By the time you see visible mold, you're talking about 55 million spores per square inch before you even see it as visible mold. So if you've got a little bit of visible mold, it's likely to be a little problem. Big visible mold, big problem. The problem is what you see on the plaster wall may be the Titanic iceberg behind the wall. And that's why by the time you're seeing visible mold, you probably need a building biologist to go and assess the property. So the cause of mold is moisture. Mold and fungi isn't the problem because fungi and bacteria are everywhere. They're not a problem providing you don't give them liquid water or water vapor. The problem is when you're living in humid environments like Sydney, Central Coast, Queensland, is that the mold in the carpet on the surface in the household dust, it's utilizing the water vapor in the air and it's proliferating already. So often when I'm doing uh, audits in mold testing in Sydney, you know, using the ATP swab, it's high microbial activity because it's actually utilizing the water in that air. And that is already very problematic. In those areas, you have to use dehumidifiers. Permanent dehumidification is the most important to prevent mold in those high humid climates. And unfortunately, because of climate change, this high humidity is coming down south and it's happening in a really short period of time of just, you know, just in the last two decades. Sydney's getting warmer and warmer. It's more and more humid in God knows by 2050, Melbourne's gonna be more like Sydney. Um, and this is obviously the ramifications on our food supply, pollination, I don't even want to even think about that. So a building biologist is really important to get when it comes to testing water damage building. The reason is because if you're getting your insurance company to come in to deal with mould and someone comes in and they're not testing the building, they don't know what they're doing. You cannot remediate a building without testing because you need to know where's the moisture and that can only be done with moisture meters and a good visual inspection, which is what building biologists are trained to do. Thermal imaging is also really important. The equipment we use is expensive, but you pay a bit more for the building biologist to do the job and it will pay dividends because then the remediation will be uh, more accurate. So the first goal to test a water damaged building is to always identify the source of moisture and moisture laden materials. As soon as you have moisture sitting on a surface for more than 48 hours, it will support microbial growth. And that's why going in, when a builder or a mediator goes in and just fogs, 
Firstly, fogging introduces more moisture in the air, which actually exacerbates the problem. It temporarily kills everything in the air. So when they sample it, they say everything's dead. But within two weeks or a month, the building biologist goes in there and goes, what are you talking about? It's worse than ever because they didn't get to the source of the moisture. So if you've got plasterboard that's wet for more than 48 hours, rule of thumb is to get rid of it. If it's porous, you need to discard it. Um, it's always important. It's like, you know, you've got an overflowing bath, the water's lapping into your hallway, so you get all your dry towels to dry out the water in the hallway, but you forgot to turn the tap off in the bath. It's the same principle. So really important to identify the source of moisture. Is it a humid climate? In Sydney, I would say you need permanent dehumidification or a, um, a dehumidifier with a hygrostat. So it kicks in when the humidity is above 60% and it stops when it's below 40%. That would be ideal. If you live in Sydney and you want to go to Europe for four weeks, cool, but don't turn your dehumidifier off because you're going to come back to a mold box. And that people think they save money by turning their air conditioning off, which acts as a dehumidifier. Well, the cost of remediating, remediating your house is going to be in the tens of thousands when you get back from a four-week trip when you've got high humidity in the house. The cost of living in a humid environment is that you have to dehumidify. That's the cost. So if you're aware, living in those environments, it comes at a cost, and that means having permanent dehumidification or at least an ability to dehumidify when the humidity is uh, above 60%. Condensation from inadequate ventilation. The first thing, one of the first things I did moving into this home is I actually replaced everything with louver windows. I think the window guy was shocked because, you know, you know, these are the louver windows that are panelled <laughs> and everyone's removing them because they were popular in the 60s. Now they've made them really well and they're quite well sealed. Um, but it's just beautiful. You know, when I'm when it's hot during the day and cool at night, I'm literally opening up my louver windows um, from one end to the other end of the house and within two minutes the whole house is cool. Passive ventilation is important. I would not be living in a new home and especially multi-storey home knowing what I know now because they're so tight, they are a disaster in terms of exposures to condensation and mould-related problems. Plumbing is a big problem. Flexible braid water hoses, as I said, need to be replaced at least every five years. When you get your licensed plumber coming in, make sure they check that it hasn't been compromised, it's not corroded. Um, very important that it's in good condition. Drainage. You can't spend enough money on drainage. If you live on a hill, in a hill, at the bottom of a hill, you've got to spend thousands on drainage. Double the drainage. Make it an industrial-like drainage. You can't spend enough. Building biologists just have to look at the house and go, oh, my God, flat roof, on a hill, inadequate drainage, hasn't been maintained. It's just we see it over and over and over again. So it's really important that the drainage is adequate, that the stormwater system is sufficient for that one in 20 year flood, that it can cope with all of that moisture and push it away from the house. Roof leaks. I'm always shocked people just don't maintain their gutters. You know, they think they get the leaf guard. The leaf guards are worse. And the reason is because the leaves sit there, they eventually degrade, it creates sludge in the gutter, and actually that accelerates corrosion of the gutter. And it makes it really difficult to clean. I like gutters I can see so I can get my hands in there and actually get rid of it. I clean my gutters every six weeks because I live in a vegetated area and the cost of me living in a vegetated area means I have to clean my gutters every six weeks because they're full. Um, and that's just part of maintenance. It's like a service and tune for your body. You have to do it for your house. Many of the problems we see as building biologists are just like maintenance. You've got to do it. If you're in a rental, then you need to have that negotiated. The landlord needs to be doing it regularly or you need to be doing it. Whoever's living in the house they're going to be doing, that'll come at the cost of them. So it's really important that you do that. Really, really important. Uh, waterproof membranes are a big issue. So, again, look at that. The second thing a building biologist does apart from identify the source of moisture, is to determine how far the fungal particulate has spread. Now, fungal particulate is spores and hyphae. 
basically, if you look at this diagram, you can see once hyphae sits on a surface, it infiltrates and it sits there. The spores will sit there. Once it gets moisture, it then creates hyphae, which infiltrate that surface. And then the hyphae specialize into canidia pores, and then they'll produce spores or what we call canidia. The spores come off and then they go into the air where they settle, wait for more moisture, and then they start the whole process again. The canidia and the hyphae is what we refer to as fungal particulate. When it comes to fungal particulate, the only way you're going to know how far that spread is to sample. That means surface sampling and or air sampling. Without doing that, you are guessing. No one knows. You know, I'm always amazed with mould. What I think is a problem and what is a problem is always different. So now I just keep my mouth shut and go, yes, you've got sources of moisture here, Mrs Smith, but until I get those lab results back, I'm not going to give you any advice because those lab results will give me a lot better idea of the extent and the magnitude of the problem, if it is a problem, and the magnitude of the problem. And then we can put it into context based on the risk, you know, asthma, allergies, your kids, your husband, et cetera, based on their health symptoms. So a building biologist will quantify visible mould and odours using the NIOSH tool, National Industrial Occupational Safety and Health tool, and conduct sampling. And more importantly, only by doing sampling can we assess condition, condition one to three. Once you've assessed condition one to three of the built structure and contents, only then can you actually determine what to do to remediate. So building biologists will use the various tools from moisture meters, that alone is two grand. That's probably the most available tool we have. Thermal imaging, boroscopes, biopumps are important. You spend, you know, 1,500, two grand with a building biologist is worth gold compared to getting a builder, spending two grand, fogging your place. Four weeks later, you're still sick, it goes through insurance, your kids are still sick, and eventually they end up having to get us in anyway. So you do the job properly or just don't do it at all. With lab testing, it's really important. It tells us a lot. It tells us about the hyphae. The hyphae tells us about growth. The higher that is, the more closer we are to the source of the moisture and the growth of the mould. In this case, you can see in the master bedroom, the hyphae was 573. That's extreme. So we know there's actual mould growth happening in that room. And because we couldn't see it and we couldn't smell it, we need to actually pull off that structure, look at the floors, look at the walls to actually see where it's hidden, find it. Here we've got Aspen, Aspergillus penicillium, 247,200. This was so bad, this family literally walked out with just the clothes on their back um, because of the extent of what had happened. They had a butterfly roof and when it rained, they'd be water dripping on their bed. They had a south wall that you could poke your finger through the plasterboard and been wet and dry for so long. The balcony was actually had positive fall to the master bedroom. So when it rained on the balcony, it went to the master bedroom. I mean, this is the this was a 1965 house in Melbourne. It's just a disaster. And these people were very, very sick. Stachybotrys, worst case scenario, one of the worst for mycotoxins, um, which is deadly. 351,000 spores. This was just a house I did two, two years ago. I mean, you see this and you go, you need to walk out now. Yeah. So lab testing is important because it tells us, okay, kids' bedroom, spare bedroom, how bad is it? How far is the fungi spread from the source of moisture? And then we can establish a scope of works. The third thing a building biologist will do is to identify potential pathways. If it started in the bathroom because of poor ventilation and high water vapour, it's then be pulled through the exhaust fan. So now we have fungal particulate that's gone into the roof void. Where does it go from the roof void? Where does the air travel to other parts of the house as to where we need to test to see how far the mould remediation job needs to go? If it's, for example, in a rising damp, are there cavities within the walls that is resulting in it spreading up to second and third storeys? Are there basements where it's coming up through the stairwell? Are there lift pits in the multi-storey building where it's actually going to other floors? Is it the split system? Is it the vacuum cleaner? Because the cleaner, they have a professional cleaner that's using their vacuum cleaner and spreading their fungal particulate from one water damaged home to the other. These are pathways by which fungi can spread and these are the things that building biologists will ask. So testing is important. You spend a bit more to do it properly and that will give you a better scope for remediation. So how do you remediate? The key is to first address the moisture. 
turn the tap off in the bath. Don't bother drying the hallway water until you've turned the tap off. That's the key. Otherwise, you'll never prevent it. Making sure you have a good stormwater system that can divert water away from the house, making sure that if you live in a high humid environment, especially Central Coast, Sydney, Queensland, Darwin, you've got to have dehumidification. Um, and in Melbourne and, and Adelaide and Perth, you know, more often than not, it's liquid water that's causing the problem and therefore you need to dry it out within 48 hours. Mold remediation does not involve fogging. Nowhere in the ICIC do they say fog, but unfortunately insurance companies will employ builders who have no idea what they're doing as remediators or Dr. Mold or who God knows whatever term they use, who actually don't know what they're doing, who come in in fog, introduce more moisture in the environment that allows more fungal particulate to go off, but temporarily kill something in the air, then do lab testing to say it's done. In fact, they've actually created more harm. The only time you use chemicals in mold remediation is you don't. You only use it if there's sewage or black water or bacterial contamination, if cereal, if um, black water or sewage is involved. So killing mold with chemicals is a big zero no. Why? 75% of mold spores oh, are dead yes. already. They're already dead. So there's no point killing mold that 75% is dead. As long as there's high levels of fungal particulate and you inhale dead mold, you are going to get sick, asthma, allergies, pneumonia, fatigue syndrome. So it doesn't matter if it's dead, it's still going to make you sick. So the way we assess in building biology as to mold remediation is to actually determine the condition. Is it condition one, two or three? Condition one is normal fungal ecology. So when you do sampling, you're going to find ascospores, basidiospores, depending on the soil ecology and the fauna around the, the environment, you might find even cladosporium. That may be normal fungal ecology for that house in that climate. That's fine. Condition two, however, means high settled spores. Condition two happens when you've had a previous mold job, all this fungal particulates come off, it's sitting on the surface, it's been there for 20 years. The problem is you've moved and bought a second-hand home, you've gone in, you don't know the history, you then have a flood, that flood creates high water vapour that's now set off a 20-year-old other fungal issue that happened 20 years ago before you, built the, before you bought the house from another family and now that fungal particular, what we call condition two, that's all starting to sporulate as well. So this is the intricacies of what's going on in the built environment. The more you know about the history of the house, the more better, the better it is to understand why so many people are getting sick. Condition two can only be established with testing because you can't see visible mould and it looks fine, but the test of the surface sample or, or swab will tell us potentially there's pathogenic fungi there. Condition three, more often than not, means actual growth and more often than not, there's visible mould. If there's visible mould, that's a problem, that's a red flag, that means it needs to be addressed. So how do we remediate? Well, it depends on the porosity of the material. If you have condition two, remember condition two is high levels of fungal particulate and you're not going to know without testing with swabs and biotapes. Um, that if it's a non-porous surface like glass or metal, you're literally just going to clean it off with a microfiber cloth. If it's um, more than a, um, the size of a piece of paper, you'd normally vacuum it with a vacuum cleaner, with a HEPA filter, and then use a microfiber cloth and then vacuum. That's how a remediator would do it. If it's less than the size of a piece of paper, you won't need, it'll just be something you can do yourself, providing there's nothing hidden in other parts of the house. If it's condition three and it's a non-porous surface, like a window, you're literally just cleaning the visible mold off with a microfiber cloth. If you have asthma and allergies, you should be wearing a full face respirator because much of the exposure not only happens with the lungs, but also happens in the eyes. Many of the building biologists I trained with in the US 20 years ago developed chronic fatigue and thyroid related pathologies because they only wore respirators when they did mold testing and they never covered their eyes. Much of the fungal particulate comes through the eyes and that's where it can make you sick also. The second thing is if it's semi-porous. So if you have unsealed timber, brick, plaster, concrete, uh, any form of particle board and it's condition two, the general rule of thumb is either HEPA vacuuming, air washing or abrasive methods, which is what a remediator would do. So for example, if you had visible mold 
in the bearers or joists in the subfloor under the house, then the remediator might use sandblasting with talc or dry ice to get rid of it because to replace that structure is really costly and it may be cheaper to do abrasive testing, um, abrasive form of methods like sanding or sandblasting. If it's condition three, um, the general rule of thumbs is that, and it's semi-porous, it's to literally discard it, get rid of it. So uh, unsealed wood, unsealed timber, brick plaster, if you can discard it, great. Otherwise, a remediator may need to use abrasive methods. With porous materials, if there's visible mould on it, the rule of thumb is get rid of it, discard it, don't launder it, nothing. If there's visible mould on upholstery, <laughs> carpet, rugs, underlay, mattresses, wicker, which is mattress mould, paper, books, fine art, get rid of it. Visible mould on porous materials needs to go. If it's condition two and you can't see mould, then the building biologist will help save costs by doing things like sampling, doing short samples in your wardrobe and making doing an air sample, you know, a $100 air sample will be able to give you an idea what to do with all that the clothes. The general rule of thumb is if you have condition two in your wardrobe and there's no visible mould, it's just to actually wash it and then air dry it in, you know, dry it in the sun. So that's good news. If you have visible mould on your clothes, it needs to go in a garbage bag and thrown out in the bin. Now, because it's mould, there's no council restrictions on how to get rid of mouldy materials. You literally just put it in the bin. If it's porous and it's worth a lot, say, for example, it's the Louvre in France <laughs> and it's a you know, $10 million painting, there are companies that can restore it. Anything can be done, but in the end, the, the, the real answer is how much money do you want to put to it? Yes, the building biologist can test the pillow that you got from your great aunt who did the tapestry, but are you prepared to pay $100, $150 to test the pillow? That's the question. So these are the things that you know we'll be asking. When it comes to content, as I mentioned, if it contains visible mould, condition three needs to go. End of story, no point in testing. So there's different methods. So you can see here, there's um, blasting, microfiber cloths, um, they're wearing full face respirators, et cetera, and doing blasting methods. So, I mean, this is significant. This is what we call condition three. You can see the visible mould on the joists and the barriers. I mean, that's just a disaster, but of course, to replace the structure, it's probably more expensive than the tens of thousands are going to pay getting someone to do that. So in terms of testing, um, go to the ASBB, the Australasian Society of Building Biologists.org.au have uh, an extensive array of qualified building biologists who have conducted nationally accredited training. It is an extensive advanced diploma of building biology. Um, that involves, you know, four years part-time, two years full-time of training. Um, there are various building biologists in different states. I've got a few here that you I want to keep on here so we can ask questions to. From Queensland to um, Sydney, you've got Jeanette and you've got Reese and you've got Kelly and you've got Bronwyn, um, you've got Louise in Melbourne. So, you know, you've got people in most states. You've got Diane in WA and Trin. So have a look on the ASBB website to find a practitioner who will be able to assist you. But, you know, as I said, the 1500 two grand you're going to spend for your single story house is nothing compared to the cost it's going to have to your health. And more importantly, it will be able to give you some guidance on how to properly remediate. We also have mould testing technicians and they are people who've done part of the building biology course. They've done one subject called mould testing. And this is a comprehensive course. It's 150 hours, which is what the building biologists do that looks at um, how to conduct an assessment of a water damaged building. When it comes to remediation, if you're a pub member of the public and you've got problems with mould, Make sure whatever the, whoever the insurance company gets out that they're double ICSC accredited. Now, what some sneaky remediators do is that the person who owns the business did the double ICSC water damage restoration or remediation course, but the person who's actually doing the cleaning and the remediation has not done the course. So the first thing I tell all my clients is, whoever comes to do your house, they must show you this card and it must be relevant. So make sure that they're actually certified. The technician who's doing the cleaning is certified with the double ICSC. Now, this is um, considered to be best practice 
I have to say, even if they are ICSC certified, they could do a crap job, but that's the best we've got to work with at the moment. You're probably best to talk to your local building biologist as to who they would recommend because they would have a better idea because they're working with these people all the time. I've got great mould remediators who do great jobs with some people and shitty jobs with others. So, you know, there's not one that does the best job, but there certainly are some good remediators out there that can do the job. It is a very difficult job. It's a glorified cleaning job. And let's face it, many of the older homes have multiple water damage, multiple visible mould and, and mould issues that make it difficult for a remediator to do a good job, even if they mean well. So the rule of thumb is if you're gonna, if the insurance company is gonna get someone out, make sure they show you this card. Not the build, not the company, the business, but the actual technician who's going to do the job. So the rule of thumb is if you're not willing to put the costs into maintaining the property, don't become a landlord. That's my rule of thumb. Homes cost money, they, they need to be maintained, they need services in tune. As I said, I do my gutters every six weeks, which most people don't even do it every four years from the ones I talk to, and that's a problem. And it comes at a cost. So for more information, we have the mold testing technician course um, at the Australian College of Environmental Studies. We also have the Advanced Diploma of Milk Building Biology, which was recently re-accredited through the Australian Skills Quality Authority. Um, and we have a few upcoming talks. So the next talk we're going to have is on feng shui free talk on how it impacts your health, wealth and relationships. And Katina Bennis, who's got two decades experience in this, will be discussing this on the 14th of April. If you go to the college here under ACES, open days, you'll see a link there. We also will have a talk on pre-inspection tips and how to avoid a lemon <laughs> on Thursday, the 6th of May at 8 p.m. Just before I finish off and go into questions, I'd just like to share um, information on the college website. If it's there, where is it? Hmm. I'll just open up the college, here we go. So at the Australian College of Environmental Studies to find out more information about what we offer, the information sessions, if you click that, that's where we have our free talks. Um, we also have um, several nationally accredited courses from the Advanced Diploma of Building Biology, the Cert for in Feng Shui, the MOL testing course, EMF testing course, and um, yeah, all of the information is there. I won't bother going into any more detail. If you want more information about the actual courses if you click on the information session you will see my last talk which went for an hour and a half on the last watch the last information session which we go into detail on the courses and I take you into the back of Moodle which is our online platform where I actually show you what the courses look like the videos the manuals etc cool so I'm going to stop there and um, stop recording <laughs>